गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन हाई आई एम डॉक्टर संदीप शर्मा सो दिस इज नॉट अ स्ट्रेटेजी सेशन दैट आई एम गोइंग टूडे दिस इज अ प्योरली अकेडमिक थिंग लॉट ऑफ स्टूडेंट्स हैव आस्ट फॉर डिटेल्स ऑफ एंटीनेटल हाइड्रोनेफ्रोसिस बिकॉज दिस इज अ ट्रिकी टॉपिक इफ यू ट्राई टू रीड फ्रॉम नेल्सन एंड देर आर देर हैव बिन सम क्वेश्चन इन सुपर स्पेशलिटी एग्जाम इन दास्ट in which uh, the answer cannot be made based upon only what is given in the textbooks itself so what i have tried to do is uh, i have stuck to nelson basically but also taken into account about three to four different textbooks and two review articles to give you a summarized form of what you need to know it is going to be slightly lengthy uh, but this video will obviously after some time it will be it will remain available for some time and later on uh, the edited version of this will be available on the uh app as well so i hope you will be benefiting from this session and i hope your exams are going uh, your exam preparation is going fine because the exam has been postponed so you get bonus time when the exam will be held frankly nobody has an idea uh at least a month or so we can expect that uh, then there will be some uh, degree of time allowed to you so let us not waste any time and start with the discussion start with the session and uh, i'm going to share my screen so so uh, here i am going to discuss the summary of antenatal hydronephrosis for pediatric super specialty exam so let us start with the discussion in case there is any doubt any lag or anything just let me know so i will correct it immediately so what exactly is antenatal hydronephrosis the name itself is saying antenatal hydronephrosis sometimes in different textbooks and review articles it is also mentioned as fetal hydronephrosis sometimes it is also mentioned as prenatal hydronephrosis but the currently followed nomenclature is anh that is antenatal hydronephrosis so uh, when you do antenatal ultrasound and you are able to find dilatation of the pelvic elliecial system we call it as antenatal hydronephrosis right antenatal hydronephrosis is a very commonly encountered phenomena majority of them are actually benign they are transient and they tend to improve however it is important to identify and follow up the patients who are having progressive dilatation because these may be sinister pathologies manifesting masquerading as hydronephrosis so if i have to show you in a image form uh, have a look at this image you will find that uh, these are the two kidneys antenatally which have been shown you can find that in the right kidney this there is no hydronephrosis which is present but the left kidney you can easily find that there is significant hydronephrosis present so when you do ultrasound you will find hydronephrosis there are various grading systems uh, there are ultrasound based grading systems which are available we will talk about them as well so this is hydronephrosis so if somebody asks you what is antenatal hydronephrosis presence or detection of dilated pelvic elliecial system on antenatal ultrasound is called as antenatal hydronephrosis right so what are the key points to remember from exam point of view first thing is it is a very common phenomena and it occurs in 1 to 5% of all pregnancies it is a huge number 1 to 5% of jitni pregnancies hain you are going to find some degree of antenatal hydronephrosis this is one uh, you you will find that statement based questions are sometimes asked and fact based percentage based questions are sometimes asked in super speciality so whatever things i am discussing in this video every word everything is important right so 1 to 5% you need to remember then majority of them are self limited and they tend to resolve without any sequelae so isme five word yaad rakhna hai so up to 5% of all pregnancies antenatal hydronephrosis occurs and by 5 years of age majority of them tend to resolve so five word is important right once they are detected obviously antenatally and postnatally follow up will be indicated in these patients and if it is severe it can produce 
oligohydramnios and you know that severe oligohydramnios can be associated with pulmonary hypoplasia as well so many times even fetal intervention will be needed in a minority of these patients and uh, if oligohydramnios occurs in the second trimester it has a poor prognosis it is a old uh, when pgi used to have super specialty exam it was a statement based question asked at that time it is taken from two different textbooks both of them are indian textbooks there it is a point not mentioned in nelson so it is a mcq point please add it to your notes past mcq point past mcq statement always has a tendency to be asked again in the exam so if oligohydramnios occurs in the second trimester compared to third trimester it will always have a poor prognosis right now uh, what about laterality kitne cases mein it is unilateral kitne cases mein antenatal hydronephrosis is bilateral you will find that unilateral is more common unilateral is found to be there it is present in about 65 to 70% cases so 65 to 70% 65 to 70 percent cases you will find that these patients are found to have unilateral hydronephrosis obviously bilateral will be in up to 30 percent cases so 15 to 30 percent is mentioned in uh, various books as bilateral so bilateral will be about up to 30 percent cases the range given in various books is 15 to 30 percent now mild dilatation in many babies particularly isolated mild pelvic dilatation also called as pelvic tsis may be seen in antenatal ultrasound of down syndrome majority of these patients do not have any abnormality postnatally but if you are asked what is the important common syndromic association of benign mild dilatation of pelvic ileal system the answer will be down syndrome it is again a potential mcq point for your exam now moving further what is the etiology of anh uh, i had also made a small rapid revision reel on this uh, which came on instagram some days back because this is a neat super specialty mcq so etiology of antenatal hydronephrosis according to nelson according as per nelson the most common cause is transient hydronephrosis transient hydronephrosis is found to be the most common cause and nelson gives a range between 41 to 88% 41 to 88% patients to be having transient hydronephrosis right second most common cause is urethro pelvic junction obstruction also called as puj obstruction pelvic ureter junction obstruction which is present in about 10 to 30% cases third most common cause is vesico ureteric reflux that is vur which is slightly less common than upg obstruction it is about 10 to 20% and fourth most common is urethro vesical junction obstruction or uvg obstruction it is also it tends to produce large size dilated ureter so we also call it as mega ureter and other common causes include uh, posterior ureter wall ectopic ureter urethrocele prune belly syndrome etc so these are the common causes of anh and one liners on these have already been asked in the past moving further how do we grade anh now grading is the point on which there is a lot of controversy and things are difficult to understand so i'll try to simplify but sticking to the guidelines and nelson as much as possible so when we have to grade anh there are two parameters that we are going to use in these patients so grading is done based upon two factors the first factor is timing of ultrasound at what point you are doing ultrasound whether it is prenatally or postnatally and if it is prenatally because we are talking about antenatal hydronephrosis uh, what is the trimester so second trimester third trimester different values are present and what are the values that we consider it is the a r a p r p d a p stands for anterior posterior renal pelvic diameter so we always calculate the renal pelvic diameter before we go to abnormal thing we should know the normal thing so there is a past super specialty mcq which is the normal a p r p d right uh, they had obviously mentioned uh, different different uh, criteria so uh, the exact question is not there in the public domain it is uh, a part of my old collection which i had taken from uh, some of my juniors so there was there is a uh, you know mention that there was one question in i think 2018 or so 18 or 19 there was what no uh, it was 19 or 20 there was one question on eprpd so what could have been asked the normal value so normal if you uh, normal baby you check you do a antenatal ultrasound you will find that prenatally if it is done 
between 16 to 27 weeks, the renal pelvic diameter size is always less than four millimeters. With 28 week onwards, still the time of birth, it is about seven millimeters or less than that. And postnatally, beyond 48 hours, it is less than 10 millimeters. So these are the normal values that you are supposed to remember. Now coming to the abnormal values. So what is the grading system that we follow? So these are on one side, you have the grade of antenatal heteronephrosis, which will be mild, moderate, severe. And then we have the APRPD values. APRPD values will be different in second and different in third trimester. Right. So first is mild antenatal hydronephrosis. If the anterior posterior renal pelvic diameter value is between four to six point nine, it is not seven. Please remember that four to six point nine. That will be mild hydronephrosis. Whereas in the third trimester, it will be seven to less than nine millimeter. Right. Seven to eight point nine millimeter. What is moderate? It is seven to up to 10 millimeters and nine to up to 15 millimeters in third trimester for moderate hydronephrosis. And then we have severe antenatal hydronephrosis where it is more than 10 mm in second trimester and more than 15 mm in third trimester. When whenever you have a question in super speciality, if it is a neat PG level thing, uh, then you know, broad values can work. But in super speciality exam, they will put very close options. They will put uh, equal to less than, equal to more than, please be careful about these points. That is why I am not writing. Uh, I'm, I've taken the snapshot and sharing it with you so that there is absolutely no way, uh, even while writing, something goes wrong from my end. So please remember these values. The equal to, bala, jo sign hai, please do not mark it wrong. So this is regarding the grading of antenatal hydronephrosis. Now, what are the clinical points regarding ANH that you need to know? Most patients with early or mild ANH, they are asymptomatic, prenatally also and postnatally also, they continue to be asymptomatic. Those who are having UPG obstruction or UV junction obstruction, they may have a unilateral mask and future risk of pyelonephritis can also be there. And bilateral moderate to severe HDN, especially in a male child should be taken seriously. You should always consider a possibility of urethral wall, right? Now, what is the risk stratification system that we follow in the uh, in, in these in antenatal hydronephrosis? This system is called as UTD system. There are two systems which are available. The more commonly one uh, which is followed in the Western countries and which Nelson plays, uh, places a lot of stress, even in our system, corporate hospitals and uh, where, where facilities for adequate uh, follow-up are there, the UTD system is the one which is frequently followed. So UTD system, UTD basically stands for ur urinary tract dilation system, right? How much is the urinary tract dilating and what are the coexisting problems that is used to define the risk categories of ANH? One is mild, moderate, severe ANH. That is simply based upon the, 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 the criteria which we discussed, concept trimester and APRPD value, right? Second is risk system. Risk kitna hoga? Low risk hoga or high risk hoga. This is something which is called as a risk stratification system. It is an entirely different system. This risk stratification system has follow-up guidelines attached to it. And so you may find difficult questions being asked upon that. It is not contradictory with whatever we have done just now before that, right? So first of all, we have the ANH, that is antenatal hydronephrosis. There are two risk groups which are defined. We have the low risk and we have high risk. There is no intermediate risk here, right? So two categories, low risk and high risk for antenatal hydronephrosis. So what is low risk? Now look at this uh, chart, which has been shown. So any patient who's having uh, 16 to 27 weeks, that is second trimester, APRPD between four to 10 millimeters and 28 week onwards, seven to less than 10 millimeters. What does it mean? It means that in the second trimester, it is, uh, these two categories, if the patient is having central or calcial dilatation, right? Either there is central calcial dilatation or no calcial dilatation and nothing else abnormal is present. The, the parenchymal thickness is normal. All these yellow boxes are basically showing you that they are normal. So parenchymal thickness is normal. Parenchymal appearance is normal. Ureter is normal. Bladder is uh, normal. And there is no oligohydramnios. 
only calicial dilatation is present either central or absent just these two values should be there they should be abnormal we will say it is a low risk patient so they are categorized as utd a1 category utd a1 is low risk patient on the other hand if uh, you find that 16 to 27 weeks ap rpd is equal to more than 7 mm or third trimester value is equal to more than 10 mm and any one of these factors are present now all these yellow boxes the the key thing to remember is any one of them any one or more of them any one or more of them you will say it is utd a2 to a3 these are the high risk patients also called as increased risk patients so if there is peripheral calcial dilatation yani ki not central but peripheral calcial dilatation or abnormal parenchymal thickness or abnormal parenchymal appearance or abnormality of ureter or bladder abnormality or oligohydramnios you will call it as utd a2 thick that is high risk patient so two risk categories low risk and increased risk now there will be certain patients who will not fit into a single category you need to understand that suppose suppose there is a patient who is uh, i'll give you a scenario there is a patient in second trimester who has a ap rpd value of uh, 9 m the patient is having no calicial dilatation but the patient is having unexplained oligohedra try to think try to think if uh, what did i say second trimester value ap rpd ka kitna 9 m right so yaha aega right no calicial dilatation to bhi yaha aega but there is presence of unexplained oligohydramnios so if you have a higher value mentioned the patient will not be categorized as low risk the patient will be categorized as increased risk in these patients so if any high risk value any significant high risk thing is present even if the other factors are favoring low risk patient you will go in for higher risk this is an important consideration that you need to remember and obviously especially in ini ss exams you may find difficult questions like these to be asked neat ss uh, less likely but obviously as as you might have seen uh, the distinction between neat ss and ini ss is it is blurring and now more and more clinical questions tricky questions are being asked so this is the first uh, this this video obviously will go up so you can listen to it again go it go slow and then try to understand whatever i just said so anh two risk groups low risk high risk even if it is looking like a low risk but any factor associated with high risk comes you will get classify as high risk patient right moving further we have the postnatal presentation also see the topic is antenatal hydronephrosis but because we are talking about the utd system so we have to talk about the postnatal presentation also particularly in a country like india you may you know ultrasound is very operator dependent and many times there are unbooked unsupervised pregnancies bachcha rural areas mein low socioeconomic status directly comes to you only in the postnatal period for for some reason and uh, you you evaluate the child and postnatally you find that there is uh, renal pelvic dilatation so how you are going to risk st uh, stratify these children so in postnatal presentation or the child is symptomatic you are doing ultrasound and you found that there is hydronephrosis these will be called as postnatal presentation postnatally there are three categories mild intermediate and severe antenatal kitna tha two category postnatal there are three categories mild intermediate severe so first of all if it is more than 48 hours see first 48 hours uh, the guidelines are not very clear they uh, you you do not usually perform unless it is a um, absolute emergency like uh, not passing urine posterior urethral wall then only you do otherwise beyond 48 hours we do the first uh, in the first week we do the first uh, postnatal ultrasound so if you find that the ap rpd value is between 10 to 14.9 mm and there is only central calicial dilatation baki kuch nahi hai everything else is normal ab oligohydramnios nahi hoga because the child has already been born right so everything else is normal so you will say it is a low risk patient utd p1 low risk patient second in case the ap rpd value is 15 mm or greater and either one of either peripheral calicial dilatation hai instead of central or abnormal ureters are present you will classify it as intermediate risk understood and if 
it is the same it equal to more than 15 mm but along with these two problems that is peripheral calcific dilatation and ureteral abnormality there are any one out of these three either parenchymal thickness is abnormal or parenchymal appearance is abnormal or the, uh, and the bladder is normal in these patients bladder normal ab oblique abnormal it is not mentioned here but uh, some of the textbooks also say bladder normal oblique abnormal these will be classified as high risk patients so the presence of parenchymal abnormality in aprpd equal to more than 15 mm will be categorized as high risk end of the day you can form generalization but uh, some degree of cramming some degree of you know uh, just rectification end of the day is needed in any entrance exam and that is true for this entrance this this topic as well that is why it is a tricky topic it is a summary that i'm talking about so i'll i'm trying to go fast but please go through all these points which i'm talking about so these are the post natal presentation so how to follow up now why did we devise this system because this system not only classifies risk stratification but it also helps in follow up there are set guidelines for that so sabse pehle prenatal prenatal low risk patient utd a1 tha right jo abhi humne diagnose kiya the two category low uh, low risk and high risk right so low risk what you are going to do in these patients on follow up one additional ultrasound will be needed in these patients right second after birth you will do another renal ultrasound postnatally beyond 48 hour to one month of age that is in the first week of life then second renal ultrasound will be done about 6 months later in these patients and genetic screening is not indicated unless there are obvious associated congenital malformations which have a tendency to be associated with a, a renal disease a, a, a congenital heart disease is there or a single umbilical artery is there then only you will go for genetic screening otherwise it is not indicated in these patients so this is antenatal hydronephrosis low risk how you are going to follow up these patients right second we come to uh utd a1 increased risk it is not low risk it is increased risk or high risk it is high risk right so in these patients how you are going to manage follow up one additional ultrasound will be needed at 4 to 6 weeks from whatever time you have done the ultrasound then in case it is suspected pub or bilateral hydronephrosis repeated even more number of hd uh, ultrasounds will be indicated after birth again just similar to that uh, you will do one ultrasound in the first week of life and if pub is suspected earliest possible you will do right and pediatric nephrology and a urologist consultation will be needed in these patients to uh, decide what next needs to be done so this is regarding antenatal hydronephrosis what about postnatal hydronephrosis so three risk group the sabse pehla postnatal uh, low risk category in these patients you will do follow up ultrasound at pehla to kar liya na postnatally jab bhi kiya aapne whatever whatever time you have done usually pehle hafte mein kiya but jab bhi kiya uske 1 to 6 month ke baad you have to do another follow up ultrasound then mcu and antibiotic prophylaxis micturitic cystourethrogram also called as voiding cystourethrogram and antibiotic prophylaxis are optional here renal scan is not indicated there is no indication for a renal diuretic scan in case it is a intermediate postnatal presentation follow up will be needed in 1 to 3 month wahan par tha 1 to 6 month now it becomes 1 to 3 month MCU renal scan antibiotic prophylaxis are optional. In practice, MCU is usually done. Uh, prophylaxis sometimes started plus minus. Renal scan usually not done. Whereas in high risk patients, the guidelines say follow up ultrasound in one month. So, पहले कर रहे थे one to six, then one to three. Now it is within one month you have to repeat another ultrasound. MCU and antibiotic prophylaxis have to be started. and renal scan is optional but in practice even nelson also agrees that renal scan is done by most of the nephrologists or pediatricians in high risk category right and uh, there is another uh, grading system which is more favored by urologist and uh, pediatric uh, uh, radiologists uh, uh, radiologist in association with pediatricians but uh, this grading system again you need to know and how sfu grading system correlates with the utd system that also can be asked to do in the exam so the second grading system 
SFU grading system. That is based. SFU grading system will be for postnatal. Please understand that. Uh, you may find, you may sometimes get confused thinking, sir, SFU antenatal me kyun hai? SFU is for postnatal. It is not for antenatal. SFU postnatal grading system. Bacha ho gaya hai. You are doing ultrasound and then you are grading for hydronephrosis, right? So SFU basically stands for Society for Fetal Urology Grading System. So this is the uh, grading. So grade zero is the mildest or normal grade and grade four is the more severe one, right? So grade zero, the central renal complex will be intact in these patients and renal parenchymal thickness will also be normal in these patients. Right. Then grade one, there will be slight splitting of the central renal complex, but parenchymal thickness will continue to be normal. In fact, the renal parenchymal thickness will become thin only in the grade four category. Grade two, there is evident splitting, but it is confined within the renal border. Grade three, there is wide splitting, pelvis dilated outside renal border, callus is uniformly dilated. Grade four, uh, the calluses tend to appear convex. That is convexity of the calluses may be seen. No, nobody is going to give you a ultrasound image and going to ask you tell the grade. These wordings will be mentioned in exam, in MCQ exam, you are supposed to remember that if it is mentioned, then which grade is That is all you are going to get. And then they are going to ask you, the more likely thing they are going to ask you is, this grade is SFU, then who will correspond to the system in the UTD system? So, SFU grade 1 and 2 will correspond to UTD P1. P1 is postnatal low risk category. SFU grade 3 will correspond to UTD postnatal second number, that is intermediate risk. And SFU grade 4 will correspond to UTD P3. Right? So severe wala jo hai, high risk is SFU grade 4 correlation. Now, what are the prenatal interventions for uh, ANH that you are going to do? Prenatal, prenatal interventions are not very common. For antenatal hydronephrosis, uh, we do, usually do not intervene unless we feel that it is a severe form and there are going to be lasting changes. So, so first of all, uh, it is indicated, practically it is indicated where there is bilateral hydronephrosis with oligohydrocephalus. Right. So remember, oligo wale patient may we prenatally in, uh, intervene. Otherwise, we don't intervene normally. And un, if we do not intervene in these patients, there is going to be a very poor prognosis and increased uh, uh, fetal and neonatal mortality have been known. So what do we do here? We place a vesicoamniotic shunt, which is a MCQ point. So prenatal intervention in oligohydramnios, you place a shunt called as vesicoamniotic shunt. Please add it prominently to your notes. Uh, you can also check for the fetal renal function, whether they are improving static or they are totally deranged. They can be done by checking for the electrolyte status in fetal bladder urine, which you can do by guided percutaneous bladder puncture in a fetus. Obviously, this, uh, this will require the help of a radiologist and it should uh, ideally be done by uh, a combination of radiologist and obstetrician, not by us. And a fetal corrective surgery can also be done if available. Uh, most of the centers, tertiary centers, they do not have this type of surgery, but uh, with, the, with the advances coming up, you will find fetal uh, surgeries for ANH also becoming relatively common. And these days, uh, fetal corrective surgeries are more commonly done for uh, conditions like congenital diaphragmatic hernia and uh, related disorders. Now, this is regarding prenatal intervention. So, vesicular amniotic shunt, kab karna hai? These are the two things that you must remember. Then, postnatal course, mein kya karenge? how you are going to manage. And postnatal course, uh, actually, Indian textbooks, Indian data, Indian guidelines are more clear, more you know, uh, specific on that. So, most cases with mild to moderate hydronephrosis will require only ultrasound monitoring according to the risk stratification we discussed. And they, most of them will show spontaneous resolution by two to five years of age. So, please remember this point. Yeah, one-liner MCQ can be asked. Two to five years, tak, most of them will resolve. About 10% of ANH patients will progress. So, 90% will resolve. And 4% will, 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 will be having a... Uh, functional severe neurological lesion, which is uh, correctable, uncorrectable, that is a different thing. 70% patients can be managed successfully on observation and close monitoring. Point to note. Now, this is again a, a scenario-based thing which can be asked during exam. 
uh, suppose you perform, you you are you, uh, you you plan to do MCU in the patient. You do MCU like we were doing in the postnatal grade three. MCU was indicated. Uh, it was also considered. It could be considered in the intermediate risk as well. So if you do MCU in moderate to severe STM and you find that there is no reflux present. If reflex is present, it is VUR. You will manage according to VUR. VUR many discussed here, body detail me, I will not repeat it here. But if you find that there is no reflux, what is the next investigation to perform? The next investigation to perform in these patients is diuretic renography. Diuretic renography, we don't do it using DMSS scan. DMSS scan is uh, for scars. What we are concerned with knowing here is the renal function. And for that, we use a MAG3 along with furuzamide. So diuretic renography with MAG3, I'm not going into details how we perform it, but it may be done to check the differential renal function. So they will give you a scenario and ask you what is the next investigation to do. The answer will be uh, check for renal function using MAG3 scan and MAG3 scan should always be done along with the diuretic. So diuretic renography will be the answer. Then, uh, what are the indications to consider early surgery postnatal? This is again a potential MCQ point. Indications to consider early surgery postnatally, like this, not given in medicine. So, if the pelvic AP diameter is more than 30 mm or more than 20 mm with calicid dilatation, that is an indication to do surgery. If there is on the affected side, there is less than 35% renal function, that is also indication to consider surgery. Now, this is point, this less than 35%, this is controversial. Let me say it very clearly. Some Indian textbooks, one review article, they say less than 40%. And some of the Indian textbooks and uh, Indian review articles say less than 35%. So uh, the ones which are more common, more popular and written by uh, some of the very eminent uh, names in the field of uh, pediatric nephrology, they say less than 35%. So I'm taking the value of less than 35%. So less than 35% renal function on the affected side. Third, easily that is why you need to do a renal function testing. You, you will need to do a MAG3 scan. Then increasing dilatation if it is present will follow up. Normally dilatation should resolve. But if you are following up and dilatation is actually paradoxically increasing, you need to do surgery. And fourth, bilateral moderate to severe dilatation with rising serum creatinine. If serum creatinine is rising, you need to do or uh, you need to consider early surgery. Finally, obstruction of a solitary kidney, single kidney, you cannot take chances. You will consider early surgery in the patient. So this finishes our discussion of antenatal hydronephrosis. I've not only covered the antenatal hydronephrosis, but also covered the postnatal, how we are going to manage because antenatal hobi kya, postnatal kya karenge, this is again going to be a problematic thing. Uh, so go through the things, go through the video again. It's a very troublesome video. Trust me, I had to do a lot of reading. I know antenatal hydronephrosis, but I wanted to be sure. And the more I read, the more I found that this is a difficult topic to do. End of the day, you may or may not get MCQ on this, but if you do, it will be a difficult question. And uh, unless they are asking the etiology and uh, whatever I've discussed, I think it covers most of the things required from entrance point of view. In case there are any doubts, you want, you want some further clarification, you read, uh, read something which is not making sense to you, you're most welcome to ask me. You can ask in the comments, you can ask on my Telegram group, you can ask on social media. And the date of SS exam is not yet announced. So you get bonus time, make use of it. And uh, in the coming month, in the month of June, I'll be coming up with uh, such difficult topic discussions summarized form at one place in within uh, half an hour uh, so that it covers all of them. So if you want me to take up any other topic which you feel it is lacking and important for super speciality, I'll be more than willing to take that. I hope it helps. Thank you very much. Uh, any doubts, anything you want to ask? So I wait. When I was a resident, I didn't think, I didn't feel that uh, I'll have to speak so much on antenatal hydronephrosis sometime later in my life. So normally we tend to associate it with, you know, uh, something which is your thoda sa padna hai and not very relevant but it is actually very relevant and it is a very common scenario also so it is more important actually for INISS but NEET SS also 
question has been asked in the past. More relevant for INS is if you're targeting uh, pediatric nephrology seats, you have to read it. Even in the AIMS departmental assessment, antenatal hydronephrosis will be asked in some way or the other. So apparently everybody is fine. So let's finish the class. Thank you so much. It's wonderful discussing everything here. All the best for your exams. Thank you.